Excellent. Well, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Brian. Ooh, thank you for the yeah, I believe uh, it's uh, it's evening for both of you. Uh, Francois, you're joining us from Play E France, and Gareth is joining us from the UK. Um, very excited to have both of you here with us. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we need to talk about is, you know, the history of Nexo as a company. You know, Nexo is a French company that was founded, you know, more than 40 years ago, just outside of Paris. Um, you know, in the last four decades, you've kind of taken your place, you know, as an elite sound reinforcement manufacturer. Can you, uh, maybe, maybe Francois, tell me a little bit about what Nexo stands for and, and why does it stand apart from the competitors? Um. Maybe, uh, maybe Brian, uh, I should go a little bit uh, on the uh, on the Nexo history. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that you get a, you, you get a little bit of a feeling of the of what is the DNA of the company. Um, the the company, as you mentioned, was founded uh, forty one years ago in uh, seventy nine, and um, and the company was founded by um, a Frenchman Eric Masno, very talented engineer. And uh, Mick Johnson, uh, an Englishman, very talented uh, financial man, and um, and this uh, partnership, uh, I believe, immediately originated and immediately positioned uh, Nexo as an international company, as a global company, because their intention when they created this company was not just to create a you know a French manufacturing speaker company for the French market, they ambitioned from the beginning to have a, a, a real international company. So in fact, the name Nexo um, uh, comes from a, a, a lake in Sweden. And the reason why they selected that name is that the name Nexo, you can pronounce it anywhere in the world. You don't have the problem with the R or with, you know, uh, whatever. So this is their main reason for selecting a, uh, this name. So. They succeeded very quickly in their ambition, uh, in the sense that, uh, well, of course, first they started uh, with uh, the French market on some custom manufactured uh, speakers for some specific uh, uh, musicals uh, uh, and applications. Uh, but very quickly, uh, they started exporting in Europe, uh, UK, Germany, Italy. After that, uh, uh, Asia, uh, Japan, China, uh, Southeast Asia, countries like uh, Indonesia, Singapore, uh, Vietnam, and uh, and then on a third step uh, around the uh, 90s uh, in uh, US and uh, Latin America. So um, so you see, it's really uh, that's probably one very important point uh, uh, that yeah that makes it an international company. And to be honest, that makes it uh, also extremely pleasant to work in because of the opening it gives us, uh, you know, to the world. Um, then if you look at these steps on the product uh, standpoint, uh, Brian, um, they, they started with, they, they were very passionate. Uh, Eric was, is extremely passionate in uh, electroacoustics. And so, uh, so there was already, you know, high efficiency uh, acoustic loads on the very first products from day one. Uh, but anyway, there was also from the beginning a very strong involvement in uh, electronics. We've been having uh, uh, controllers for our speakers uh, since, uh, uh, if I am correct, something like uh, 1984. Uh, so five years after creating the company, uh, there was this immediate understanding that uh, uh, processing and speakers could not be uh, uh, dissociated and had to be together. Uh, but anyway, then uh, Around the 90s, uh, we launched the PS10 uh, and uh, PS15. Uh, that was, I believe, a major step uh, for Nexo because uh, uh, with PS10, we started to do volume sales. So it's, it's forced us uh, to really reconsider the way we produce because when you produce thousands of speakers per year, it's not the same than when you produce hundreds. Um, so this has been a, a, a quite a, a very very successful and I would say almost a, almost a founding product for the success of Nexo. Uh, it's been in, you know, PS10 is still in the catalog today in reality, although it's been refurbished and so on. It's, I believe it's really a, a legendary product, you know, uh, on what we've done. Um, I'm not going to go through all the steps because then I'm going to take the whole hour <laughs> of your interview, Brian. <laughs> Absolutely. But, uh, 
Anyway, Alpha, Alpha was a very important milestone because Alpha in uh, 98 is the product that took us into the touring market, uh, you know, with uh, very famous bands such as uh, Oasis, Metallica, uh, Sarah Brightman, uh, uh, White Stripes, and so on. Uh, so uh, Alpha clearly is also a product that took Nexo to the, you know, to the next level. Um, and then uh, trying to make it short, uh, I believe that uh, Nexo really pioneered in the domain of digital audio networks. Uh, we were first licensees of uh, Ethersound, which was the very first digital audio network applicable to live applications, that is with minimized latency from microphone to speaker. So we came out with an Ethersound uh, uh, platform in uh, 2003. Uh, we were really first. There was no one to feed our controller in reality at that time. So we were, you know, someone has to start. and. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, to make it short, but anyway, of course, that uh, vision that Nexo had on digital network uh, uh, back in 2000 triggered lots of interest from Yamaha. So there were various steps, you know, in the uh, collaboration with Yamaha. We started partnering in 2005, developing electronics, uh, expanding our distribution, especially in the US. Um, and anyway, and since uh, everything went really well, and so since 2008, uh, Nexo is 100% of a subsidiary of uh, Yamaha Corporation of Japan. And uh, of course, uh, you will easily understand, uh, you will easily vision that a, a, a powerful company, such a historical, you know, uh, a strong company in the music industry like Yamaha, um, uh, with the, in the specific domain inventors, should I say, of digital audio in reality, um, and with, uh, you know, with DSP uh, abilities, that partnering with Nexo opens fantastic, you know, opportunities. It's uh, almost uh, on a daily basis that we go, hey, you know, we can do that. Oh, we should do this. Or we can do that because together we can do that. So that's, uh, I'm not sure I answered properly no. to... Uh, I, I, absolutely. And, and, and Gareth, pay attention. I, I have a follow-up question for you from what Francois just said about the relationship between Yamaha. But before I go there, I'd like to ask another a follow-up to Francois about transitioning from a system like Alpha. You know, it was, you know, one of the last high Q point source systems that came to the market. And then Nexo transitioned from alpha to line array systems. Can you touch on some of that, you know, maybe include some of the technologies like the hyperbolic waveguide reflector, you know, how did, how did that, how did that, that mind shift come about? Okay. Okay, Brian. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try not to take the full hour again on that story <laughs> as well, but uh, yes, uh, uh, around, around 2000, uh, we launched the alpha, as I mentioned in 98 and alpha was extremely popular, extremely, successful, uh, although, as you mentioned, it was one of the uh, last high-Q uh, you know, uh, point sources uh, 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 available on the market. By being the last, in reality, that's easy. I'm not, I'm not making any you know, arrogance there, but by being the last, it was easy to make it the best because we could see everything that had been done and you know, so we could make it the best. So Alpha was there for quite a time. And uh, so uh, we had many competitors uh, around 2000 with uh, line arrays. All of them, no exception, were really targeting the top high-end markets. This was for high-end, you know, high-profile stores and so on. And to be honest, to start developing a line array, uh, there are many obstacles you have to overcome. Um, you cannot develop a line array from scratch if you have not overcome many technical obstacles. Uh, so one of them, in fact, was uh, you know uh, the fact that uh, you need an isophase wavefront on the output uh, of the cabinet along the height of the box uh, up to 20k, and that you cannot escape. So for a while we scratch our heads, you know, in front of a whiteboard, how to convert you know a circle, a disc, into you know something which could be a flat or a curved ribbon. What kind of device could do that? And so um, we, we ended up finding uh, that was uh, in 2000. So we filed the patent on what became the hyperbolic reflective wave source, the geo wave guide. And then uh, it was about what product now. And the pressure was extremely high from uh, you know, our uh, users, the alpha users at that time. So that we would do some kind of alpha line, uh, alpha line array. 
but uh, we resisted to that. And instead of doing that, um, we, uh, we took the smallest cabinet in our catalog, which is the PS8, and we thought we should do a line array of that format. So we did GOS8. And, uh, and in that segment, uh, the applications are enormous because S8 was capable to do everything, almost everything except what requires high SPL, of course. Mm -hmm. But the applications were enormous, where, uh, you know, in fact, we did not anticipate that they would be so important. Um, and so we were alone uh, on the market with GOS8 for, I would say, 10 years. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it is today uh, that I know uh, the cabinet that sold the most worldwide as a line array unit. We sold uh, more than 40,000 of uh, these uh, GOS8 modules. So this was the approach. And so we gradually went up, right, uh, from S8, then we moved to GOT, et cetera, et cetera. And then we moved to high end uh, 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 up to STM today. Yeah, I mean, GOT, certainly high end as well. I mean, you could have, you know, <laughs> seen it, you know, very visible on a lot of festivals and tours. I think, what did it spend half a decade, you know, at the on the pyramid stage at Glastonbury? You know, I mean, we've got there's there's a, a lineage there, you know, and 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 part of that lineage is, I guess, not being a company that follow always follows um, trends. And I want I don't necessarily want to say trends as much as it's not a hey, we've got this as well. You know, we're not following that 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 design philosophy just because another company has a design philosophy so there's clearly some very different uh things that nexo is doing can you speak to some of those um some of those technologies a little bit more on patents and 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 also i see that behind you you've got um some some interesting little artifacts if at any point you want to pick one of those up feel free i don't know if there's a waveguide back there i can't quite tell on the camera but you know yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's a it's yes we are we are passionate uh, engineers passionate with music I think this is really uh, you know what uh, uh, gathers uh, all of us here at Nexo uh, and uh, we love the connection between art music and, and science so uh, uh, anyway uh, I mentioned the various obstacles we had to overcome so let me uh, sure let me take a, I will show you a museum piece yeah that'd uh, be great. Uh, I mean. Full disclosure, I've been in the room, I've seen the pieces, I know what he's got before, back there. It's some cool it's stuff. Sure, before, we, before we filed the patent for the G-Waveguide, this is uh, in 2000, uh, we prototyped a waveguide on our CNC machine. So you can see here the prototype with the hyperbolic mirror, right? And this is exiting into a flat wave front. So what I have in hands is, uh, you know, the validation of the idea we had before we decided to file the patent. So I put it back here, and that's, uh, this is one of the latest waveguides. In fact, this is an STM. Uh, it's done on the 3D printer. So you see, this is a quarter of an STM waveguide, and you can see again, you know, uh, the uh, mirror, which is here. So this is uh, the, one of the latest evolutions of our uh, waveguide. But uh, it's not only about that, the NT, uh, Brian. You, sorry, I'll go back close to the microphone. It's not only about that. Uh, we also found that uh, uh, there were some issues in the uh, mid frequencies. Uh, S8 was to be a, a two way system. And so, because of the rule, I guess, that everybody knows today of the half a wavelength spacing uh, right between drivers, um, we, uh, uh, with an eight inch uh, driver, we had to cross over at uh, 700 hertz or something like this, 800 hertz. And that's way too low for the HF driver. An HF driver, you know, uh, distorts massively when you use it, you know, too low in frequency. Uh, so uh, what we uh, had as an idea, which we find as a patent, which is a very simple uh, uh, idea, in fact, uh, uh, maybe we have an image for that. Is, uh, was to have a device which splits the radiating surface in two. Uh, I can show you again here, uh, if you want. Yeah. See, uh, this is GOM, this is GOM front panel, and we have the image on the screen. And you can see we have this device which is splitting in two. So the distance between the drivers, between uh, the, the drivers is now divided by two. So instead of being eight inch, for example, it becomes four inch. Right, or instead of 12 inch, it becomes six inch. 
consequence of that is that we can increase the crossover point by one octave because the half a wavelength rule is now divided by two. So and what, what is the consequence? The consequence is that by increasing the crossover points by, uh, you know, multiplying the crossover point by two, we, we, we minimize distortion. The distortion is massively lowered as opposed to using the HF for that frequency range, which is typically around one kilohertz or two kilohertz. So this is not, you know, this is important. A little bit of your sensitivity around these frequencies. So distortion, lowering distortion is, is an important consequence. And <clears throat> as always, Brian, you know, what is difficult sometimes is not to have the idea, but is to identify the problem. Uh, to identify where you can progress. And um, we also realized when we developed uh, uh, GOS8 uh, that in fact, we would need variable horizontal coverage because obviously the top boxes in a, you know, in a column, in a line, don't need the same coverage than the bottom ones. The bottom ones need a wide coverage while the upper ones need a, you know, a lower coverage. So we also came with what is called the CDG and um, these are simple devices that are being added to the same box. So we don't carry two references, we carry one reference. And by inserting these devices on the output of the waveguide, we increase the coverage by 50%. So we go, for example, 80 degrees to 120 degrees. Typically, the bottom cabinets are, you know, at 120 degrees, while the upper ones are at 80 or less. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, you know, one of the things you just said there was that you know, fixing the problem isn't as hard as finding the problem, you know, um, and, and understanding uh, pain points for, for users. Um, so that's a lovely segue for me to talk a little bit about subwoofers. You know, Nexo has a, a, you know, quite a reputation in the category of subwoofers. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Nexo was responsible for the first cardioid and omnidirectional pattern in a single cabinet. Um, you know, this is a really specialized area and Nexo has always been really innovative in it. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that for me? Sure. Uh, uh, we, we were not first to issue a cardioid cabinet. There were cardioid cabinets on the market, uh, I believe, uh, shortly before us. Um, but when, uh, uh, when we started going into lineries, it became very quickly obvious that uh, lineries are nice because they are typically very long you know, in relation to mid and high frequencies, but they're definitely, a line array is a point source, uh, you know, in the low frequency domain, uh, to make it simple, right? So when you have a wavelength, which is a 17 meter, and uh, your column is two meter, that's almost, you know, a, a, a point source for low frequencies. So how to increase uh, 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 low frequency directivity? Uh, the technology, in fact, exists for a long time because it's been applied in microphones. It's doing what is called gradient subwoofers. So the radiated pressure is the consequence of a difference of pressure instead of a, a, an absolute pressure like in Omni uh, systems. So uh, it's, it's basically direct, deriving, you know, the, uh, what was done in microphones. I'm thinking about double capsules microphones, you know, for which you could configure mm -hmm. and applying that to, uh, uh, to subwoofers. Now, the, the difficulty is not to be directional. Uh, the difficulty is to have uh, two 18 inches which are producing more than one. The challenge is efficiency. And so I believe thanks to you know, the uh, skills we had in DSP and in design, uh, we were capable to come out with a CD12 first and CD18 after that, right? Which not only uh, were cardioid, but uh, were highly efficient. In reality, they were more powerful than many of the available Omni uh, 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 subwoofers on the market at that time. And so we carried on, but again, the first patent, yes, that is filed for a that can be either Omni or Cardioid on a standard format. Got so we don't have to work on combination. This is uh, was RS15, uh, RS18, uh, still in the cut today. And you know, it's it's a story about always making it better and better, Brian. Absolutely, you know, and some of that some of that flexibility that you see in the RS, the RS18, be Cardioid or an Omni cabinet in a in a cabinet, you know that. For Gareth, um, you, know, you know, talking a little bit about Nexo's business philosophy. You know, it. You know, Nexo is an elite speaker manufacturer. The catalog seems a 
small. Um, that's not consulting uh, by any means. You know, of course, there's always support for legacy products. I think Nexo uh, is one of the you know the leaders in just never dropping a pro you know support for for a product. Um, but there's only four loudspeaker families. You know, so from a business perspective, is it that versatility uh, of of the signal cabinet? Uh, that Francois is discussing. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, why there are, are a few models and how that, how from a business perspective, you expect to cover multiple applications in multiple markets? <laughs> Let's see. So when we are at the design stage at Nexo, creating a new family of speakers or even an individual unit um, we're not going to develop something because we can we'll always develop something that there's a requirement for or fits a purpose within the marketplace um, and more is not always better so you're much better off designing a compact more efficient product range that gives the user versatility um, now, it's also not about you, um, versatility. If you are a rental company, the inventory you've got in your warehouse is money. They're not loudspeakers. That's cash sat on the shelves in your warehouse. So, for instance, if you buy four line array systems for different applications, you have four systems that aren't always being rented in your warehouse. If you buy one system or a maximum of two systems that can work together because of that versatility so that any top box can work with any sub, you can use a large top box, a small top box, medium sized top box and everything works together. You cut down on your investment, which gives you a better return in the long run and helps your business. So it's a philosophy thing with, we believe in versatility and not making something just because the com competition does, for instance, and end up with 300 lines um, just in one sector of your catalog. So it's not only about that, but it's also about what our customers need and want to make a better business for them. It's a business proposition. Absolutely. And, you know, um, so Francois, you know, speaking about, you know, having that small line, but having versatility within that line, are, do all the, do all the, does everything play nice together? Is this a family? Um, I'm, I'm not sure on your question. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the you know, the, the ID series, how does the ID series play maybe with the GOM series, with STM, you know? Uh, it's, uh, as Garrett mentioned, uh, we, I believe we really have a, a, an optimized catalog, right? Uh, which is the right amount of references for the benefit of uh, uh, our manufacturing for the benefit of uh, our distributors and our end users. So the four series are, and you know them, brand the ID series when we start, then we have the, the plus series, then we have GOM, and then we have STM, which is high end. So uh, uh, how they work together? Uh, sometimes, to make it clear, sometimes you have ID series for applications such as, uh, you know, video mapping or, uh, you know, uh, uh, headquarters, big companies headquarters, and they're used, you know, they're designed, they're, they're, the intention is really to go in these markets, so the cabinet will be there on its own. But if you take an ID series and uh, you want to use it with GOM in a theater, yes, uh, the sonic signature has to be the same. So, of mm -hmm. course, there's a great deal of, of work which is done on that to make it uh, remember also that uh, uh, what we owe, what we have, what we commit to our end users is to make their life easy. So we don't want them to spend hours, you know, in fine tuning and re queuing all the boxes, et cetera, so that they sound together. This is something we owe to the end user. And we, I believe, even make it better than that because not only uh, there are really all the range is extremely consistent in terms of sonic signature, so that is just a matter of properly aligning levels and delays, uh, but we also have linear phase all across the range. All the Nexo speakers, including subwoofers, have exactly the same phase response, okay? So we have a little bit of group delay in the low frequency down up to 300 Hertz. 
because otherwise, if we had to go linear phase, it would be too much latency. And then it's flat uh, all the way up to 20K after that, which means that you can use any subwoofer inside the range together with any cabinet inside the range. And you can select any crossover point, 85, 120, or 60 Hertz. And you won't have to worry about the alignment because you won't have to take tables to look at the value of delay that has to be applied and so on. Um, so this is very much in line with what Garrett said just before. Uh, I can have various Nexo subwoofers, uh, different types. I can have CD18 and I can have S118 or RS18. Well, if I don't have any subwoofers for a show, I can put them all together and they will sum up absolutely perfectly. Right? I won't have to go through intensive uh, measuring process to realign them. So you see, again, consistency, uh, uh, Sony signature, phase consistency all across the range is for sure something that makes you know, end user life a lot easier. So, Absolutely. so why not do it? <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. You know, speaking of making end user life um, easier, we're going to talk about different materials in just a minute. Um, that are used to make some of the, the Nexo products. But before we do that, I, I think maybe we should take a look at, you know, one of my favorite things of making life easy, uh, which is uh, the hospitality of Nexo. Um, and, you know, oftentimes uh, Nexo hosts uh, consultants and integrators and end users um, at the factory, at the headquarters in Play E in France, um, which is not a terrible thing. Unfortunately, right now we're not doing those factory visits, um, but you know that is you know that 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 space is a very welcoming space, and oftentimes you know one of the best thing one of the best ways for me to understand how a, a, a speaker system works is to listen to it, and these factory tours are incredibly comprehensive in terms of both understanding the technology as well as having opportunity to hear things in a lovely setting. And by the way, the the food that that Francois introduces us to is absolutely amazing. So um, unfortunately, we can't bring anybody there right now. In the future, I'm sure we'll start doing it again. But Gareth, you took the time to give us a virtual version of the uh, space in uh, Play-E. Um, there's also a factory in uh, St. Pierre de Col um, that uh, produces some of the plastic injection molding products. Um, I would love it if uh, we could all visit, you know? So for right now, if we could just visit virtually, that would be amazing. Welcome to this virtual tour in 2020 of the Nexo facility at Playe, just north of Paris. We have two manufacturing facilities in France. This is our main campus, which houses all of our timber construction, our assembly, our R&D department and engineering support department, along with sales and administration. We have a second facility further south at St. Pierre de Col, which handles all of our injection molding. So we'll start today's tour in the main building um, where we will find our main workshop for all the wooden cabinets and assembly of some of the plastic items. So moving into reception, this is where we'd normally find Alison and she'd be issuing us now with our safety boots. And we're going to make our way through the corridors of Nexo towards the main manufacturing area. And here we are, we find ourselves in the main manufacturing area at Nexo Play-E. This is our birch ply awaiting construction of cabinets. It's all sustainably sourced inside the EU. And this wood is all processed via four CNC machines here at Nexo. The first of those takes the full sheets of birch ply and cuts them down into the blanks required to assemble and cut each individual cabinet. We then have two flatbed CNC machines, which use these templates in order to accurately cut out all of the component parts and to route out holes for handles and ports, for instance. This is all done via a program in the machine written by our R&D engineers. And we have two of these machines so that in peak times we can run both simultaneously or in quieter times, one can be closed for servicing while the other one still manufactures speakers and we'll have a quick look inside of one of those flatbed CNC machines. 
Now, when we moved to the P series speakers here at Nexo, we introduced curved birch ply into our manufacturing process. So this meant the addition of our fourth CNC machine, which is capable of handling these curved materials with accuracy. Now, during the CNC machining process is where we also add the secret compartment for the RFID chips that are included in all Nexo speakers that can be used for stock control and can also be used to combat counterfeit products that we sometimes find in the market. Once the CNC machines have done their job, all of the cabinets are hand assembled. We don't use screws for the main cabinet assembly anymore at Nexo. We use a high pressure gluing system that has two benefits. It increases the rigidity of the cabinet by reducing stress caused by the screws. And the glue finish also helps towards sealing the air inside the cabinet and producing a better sound. Once all the cabinets are hand assembled, they then go through a hand finishing process to get over any of the natural defects you may find in a sheet of timber. These are filled and sanded by hand, ready for an automated sanding process which finishes the cabinet to a very exact specification. And here we see our automated sanding robot. This robot uses multiple heads and multiple sanding surfaces to sand and finish all of the cabinets and to add any detailing required. Once the robot is finished with this sanding process, all of the speakers then move on to our paint finishing. This is still sprayed by hand at Nexo and we have two basic paint finishes, black and white, but we also spray in any RAL color as required. So moving out of the main factory, we're now in a holding area where all of the empty cabinets are held prior to being completely assembled with their drivers, network filters and cables. So moving through this storage area, we'll now move into the assembly area, a lot quieter than the main factory. And here we are in the assembly area. All of the speakers at this point have their filters fitted, cables fitted and drivers. And every cabinet that goes through the production line is acoustically tested to make sure it meets the correct specification. Here we have some GOS 12s currently in manufacture for a stadium project. All of the cabinets have been issued a serial number by this point as well, which identifies them and the date they were produced the batch of components used to produce them, and also links to the RFID chip that we talked about earlier. And there's some of our subs ready for testing and then packaging. Here are some of our GOM line array modules, just awaiting the front baffles with the drivers to be fitted. A great shot of the honeycomb molding finish there on the inside of the cabinet. Not all of the plastic cabinets are, are um, completed here at Playe. Some of them are actually completed at St. Pierre de Cole, including the ID24 and ID14s. Again, subs now waiting for their drivers to be fitted so they can be acoustically tested. As we move to the back of the room, you should be able to hear in the background some testing frequencies going through the RS subs you can see in front of you. These testing frequencies, when they're pumped into the cabinet, are then compared to the original specification as per the design, and every speaker is given a test or fail at this point, and that is logged again, it's against its serial number. Moving out of the assembly area, we move into the packaging area. We don't hold any finished speakers here at Playe. All of the speakers, once they are finished, are packaged up and sent off to our bonded warehouse just by Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, ready for dispatch out to our customers. This area also houses the Nexo after sales service and all of the spare parts. We will move back through the factory and move across to the other part of the campus here at Nexo, which is the R&D Centre. 
Um, that R&D Centre also houses the engineering support team and our education facilities where we deliver our Audioversity training courses throughout the year. There's some iconic Nexo products, Alpha, PCI and GOT, 45N12s there on the floor. This is the main R&D office where our engineers not only develop all of the hardware and electronics, but also all of the acoustics. Inside their R&D lab, we have three anechoic chambers, a small chamber for testing and developing drivers. This is our second chamber, which is our destruction chamber. This allows us, with the use of those fire extinguishers, to run speakers to destruction so we know exactly what they're capable of. So when we give you a speaker rating for Nexo, you know it's capable of producing those levels. Our third and most Im impressive anechoic chamber is this one. It allows us to monitor frequencies down to 28 hertz. And as you can see, it's truly massive. It's a very strange feeling when you're in this room and they close the door behind you. All you can hear is the sound of the blood running through your ears. It's a very, very strange and slightly unsettling experience. So we'll move away from this anechoic chamber now and we'll move into the area used by engineering support and R&D, not only for testing and developing products, but also for carrying out the many demonstrations that we hold during the year for Nexo users and Nexo customers. There's some amp racks loaded up and ready to use. We also carry out rigging training in this room for the Audioversity courses. Now moving out into the Nexo field, um, we have a 10 meter tall tower fitted with eight electric winches, which allows us to deploy any combination of Nexo speakers that we want to for a customer, either for a demonstration or for a system setup exercise. This field gives us 35 meters between the hanging point and the front of house position and 40 meters back to the hedge. This really does give anybody the chance to test a Nexo speaker system in a real world scenario, just as though they were outdoors doing a festival live in the summer. So that's it for this short tour of Nexo in 2020. Don't forget, once the current situation has passed, if you would like to arrange a visit to Nexo, we run multiple trips during the year. And if you would like to come and visit us here, we'd be happy to welcome you. And all you need to do is to contact your local distributor or your local, local Nexo sales representative, and they will be able to arrange something for you. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you for visiting us here at PlayE, and we look forward to speaking to you soon. Take care. Goodbye. Thanks for that virtual tour, Gareth. That's, uh, you know, a wonderful thing to have right now. And like Gareth said, you know, there's always an opportunity to visit Nexo. Um, Nexo systems are being used in, you know, more than 100 co countries right now. And I think you've hosted uh, people from, from a good portion of them, correct? Yeah, absolutely. People come from all over the world, whether that be from the US, South America, Japan, um, Russia. Um, yeah. And of course, our local French customers, um, they're a regular every week having demonstrations at the facility. That's amazing. That's a really great thing uh, to offer. Um, Francois, you know, one of the other things uh, that, I, you know, you offer at the Play E facility is, um, you know, engineering support. That's your, that's your division. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Nexo, um, you know, meets the expectations of, of, of customers that are operating at really the highest level, you know, I mean, production rental houses, uh, large format permanent installations, sports stadiums and all of that. Um, you know, what, what's, what's going on with system, uh, with, with engineering support uh, at Nexo? So, well, engineering support um, is the department we created uh, back in 2015 with Brian and uh, with the intention to, uh, uh, you know, the exclusive intention to support uh, uh, our customers. When I'm saying customers, it's everybody who is in fact, you know, dealing with Nexo products. So it's not only the distributors or not only the people we invoice, it's the people who are operating the system, the people who are designing with our systems. So the main activity of uh, engineering support department, this is uh, 
10 people uh, currently, and we keep on increasing every year. Uh, and it's 10 people worldwide. So we're on a, like a 24 seven shift at the time we have to, uh, to reply because we have people in Hong Kong and we have people in America. So, uh, um, and um, the, the three main activities there um, are, uh, one is around installation. And uh, so we support for uh, design projects, uh, you know, uh, we use an S1, we also use, uh, you know, famous uh, Ease, Cat Acoustics, everything, which is simulation software. And so we give a great deal of support for uh, 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 acoustic design, but not only acoustic design, uh, because in reality, installation is not only about having the proper coverage and so on and so on. It's also about having the right mechanics, the right rigging, the right network, um, you know, dealing, uh, uh, properly calibrating cable sections for speakers for electrical consumption so we really do our best and, and you know, we try to make it better every time uh, so that uh, when we issue a report for a project you know all the information is there included um, so that's one activity of engineering support second one is about uh, all the production companies rental companies you know which uh, are renting our equipment uh, we train them when they have, you know, when they get a delivery of an STM system. Of course, you know, we're going to go and train them on the, on the, on the system. We're going to support them on uh, events. If they have a big event, you know, we'll send one or two engineers over there to go and see how it operates and see how it works, if everything is okay, assist, help, you know. Uh, so uh, that's a, a second activity. Uh, third is about training. We have these uh, audiodiversity course, which are now unified on the same banner than uh, Yamaha. So uh, in US, for example, we have a uh, common audiodiversity courses for Nexo and Yamaha, and we do the same here in Europe and in Japan. Um, so I'm not going to develop too much on audiodiversity, but audiodiversity is not is not fundamentally about product training, although we do, we also do product training, of course, but it's not about product training, it's really about exchanging know-how, exchanging experience, trying to give some hints, which are, of course, applicable to Nexo products, but can also apply to all the other products. You know, the technical level is, is you know, raising and raising, so it is our responsibility uh, you know, to make sure that all the people that operate with our systems, you know, are getting properly trained because they are the ones, you know, by the end who are going to design and deliver for the uh, good end result. So uh, uh, in this training, this approach that we have as training is so successful, in fact, that uh, uh, we now have uh, many partnerships with the uh, universities that have uh, high-end pro audio courses. So, uh, um, so that's uh, uh, the uh, third activity. And one which is less visible is that uh, in reality, uh, 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 the engineers in that team, myself, um, uh, we are permanently in contact with customers that can be by traveling, being on site. Currently, of course, it's more like being online and being really connected online, uh, you know, and, and, and being there uh, the best we can. Uh, and so, we feedback uh, quite a lot, uh, you know, to the company. Uh, you discussed, we discussed about idea, and in fact, ideas are not that difficult. What is difficult is to identify the problem. Well, customers and users are a gold mine for Nexo because they are the ones who are dealing, you know, with their system outside. So when they feedback something, you better listen really carefully to them, you know, and properly see how you can. Uh, uh, solve so that's enormous added value should i say back to nexo uh, yeah so you see, we, we we circle uh, the loop absolutely and you know this is this is a good time for a plug for your session tomorrow uh at esdc which is uh equations for uh large arena systems so you know that's going to be an exciting one where francois bring, brings us through you know some so just more of a, a a mentality of how to budget for these kind of systems, you know, and and, and quite frankly, some of your uh, instructional material on say NS1 is not necessarily only focusing on how to use NS1, you know, prediction software, but also on the philosophies of why you would position subwoofers in a specific way. So it's more than just how to use the uh, the, the 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 tool. Um, you know, you talked about the customers and being very customer focused. Um, Gareth, you know, Nexo has 
you know, big roots in rock and roll touring. Let's, let's be honest. That's a, you know, that's a big thing. Um, right now, you know, it seems like there's a big focus on the installation sector, you know, um, can, can you talk about, uh, you know, this is kind of a, a, a loaded open question. Where do you see the company's future? I mean, are, what, what's going on? Because we're not really doing a whole lot of rock and roll touring right now. We do have a lot of, you know, installations. What, where, where are we headed? I think, to be honest, Brian, the direction of travel for Nexo is going to be exactly what it has been up to now since the formation of the company. Um, Nexo has a reputation, and yes, we started in the rock and roll industry, and what has happened to the live entertainment market in the last year is unprecedented and horrendous by any scale or measure. And we, our hearts go out to many friends and colleagues that have lost their livelihoods and their businesses in the last 12 months. Um, but that rock and roll sector, which is where speaker companies tend to make reputations, um, has always been there for Nexo, but we've also always been an installation company. So, you know, even from our the days we were founded and the start of great projects like Alpha. Um, when we have more time, I'm sure Francois will be happy to share the stories of the original installation of the Stade de France with its emergency evacuation and music system, um, which not only was Nexo directly involved with the design of the system, um, but Francois was part of the team that actually climbed through the roof of the Stade de France installing that system. Um, so whilst our systems were out with Metallica um, and Oasis and other big bands doing rock and roll tours, the same systems were being installed by Nexo into Sports Stadia. So that installation side of our business has always been there and will continue to be there. So, and it's been fairly hidden of what Nexo do, but I mean, if you just look at Europe, out of the three largest stadiums in Europe, two of those have Nexo sound systems in them, that being the Stade de France in Paris and Croke Park in Dublin. Um, we're missing one down in the Mediterranean, but we'll work on that later. <laughs> um, but we are very successful in stadiums because we've always approached the installation market, not as a rock and roll company trying to install speakers, where we approach installations as a very specific um, set of requirements. We design for that and we never try and fit a speaker into a position where it doesn't work. We're all gotcha. sure the solution is there. So going forward, we continue to develop products in the versatile way we talked about earlier, that if we design an installation version of a product that could be used for portable audio, it will fit ideally into that installation sector and do the job it's meant to do. So that will be the continuation of our development, both really in parallel. We'll never forget our roots, but we'll also never forget that our roots aren't just rock and roll. Gotcha. So it's safe to say that, you know, Nexo will continue to develop products for the live performance world as well as the installation world. Absolutely. And if you look at live, if you call live performance, um, these days, most venues that come under the installed sound heading are performing live audio in one way or another. Even stadiums now want that rock and roll experience from an emergency evacuation system. Mm. So that's a real bridge to cross is how do you make those two work together and be cost effective? Excellent. You know, and, and I think, you know, some of that can be seen in the example of, you know, there's, there's three models of Nexo amplifier right now, Correct. and they can be used for any of those applications, um, you know, so that, that, that helps drive us both in the live performance as well as the installation. We also, you know, you know when, when we look at the four families of Nexo speakers, you're seeing the ID series. That's a plastic injection molded speaker. Um, there's other plastic injection molded speakers in the lineup. Um, this is my, uh, my casual segue back to a point that you made in your video about uh, 
seeing the the, the CNC machine, seeing the plastic, uh, seeing knowing that that there's another facility that does plastic injection molding. Um, can it, can Francois? Can you speak to some of the different materials um, that are used? Are there choices for different applications? Be it you know live performance or installation. What you know what. Well, why are some wood? Why are some plastic, you know, injection? Yes, of course, of course, there are choices. Uh, uh, you know, they are not they are not coincidence, uh, uh, Brian. Uh, we we have the uh, we have the the chance at Nexo to have uh, internalized from uh, twenty years now um, um, all the injection technology, right? Uh, so this is uh, you mentioned the factory that we have uh, in Saint Pierre de Col, south uh, west of France. So we have this internal know-how, and uh, uh, while originally uh, this uh, uh, manufacturing facility was used for parts such as waveguides and so on, uh, we decided to go, you know, further. So uh, we, uh, uh, how would I say, you, you mentioned plastic. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I get a little bit sensitive when I hear that wording, uh, <laughs> because in reality, it's uh, it's uh, you know it's top research on uh, on um, on composite materials uh, with injections of uh, some additive for the benefit of acoustic performance. In reality, uh, uh, maybe people don't see that, but uh, uh, our injected cabinets uh, uh, eventually are more costly than the wood cabinets. Uh, because they're costly to manufacture, but the acoustic quality we managed to get there uh, because of the honeycomb, because of the fact that we can use composite, because of the shape we can work on, gives, gives in reality a great, uh, you know, a great acoustic benefit. Uh, so that's, you know, just to make it clear that it's not, you know, it's, it, it's not, I mean, it's not really plastic in the way people <laughs> negatively perceives it, okay? Uh, we see it as a very, uh, 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 very strong strength. Um, among the benefits, uh, Brian, for going in that direction, and we definitely did with uh, STM first, which was quite courageous, um, but then we did it for ID, all the ID series, as you mentioned, ID14, ID24. The benefits are, uh, are many. Uh, one is uh, durability. Uh, these boxes, you know, you put them out, you put them outside. ID14, we have a stainless uh, grid, screws, we have the filter which is embedded in the resin. Uh, the painted is inside. In fact, uh, the taint is in fact inside the composite material. So we have not only IP uh, uh, certification, but we have you know uh, weather resistance. The box can be installed outdoor, you know, for and and these boxes can uh, uh, last for years and years, uh, you know, outside and being you know being new after five years or ten years. So it's really that benefit. And when you have that benefit, this is very important for installation, of course. But when you design a cabinet this way, then suddenly it's also extremely beneficial to the production company. Uh, why is that? Because uh, these boxes, which are you know, with top standard quality, uh, five years later, once you've amortized them and you want to replace with something newer, the secondhand value on the market is extremely high because the box is new and, and you know, so, um, so that's, uh, that's among the benefits. I, I'm not going to cover all of them. Um, uh, one of them for permanent installation being also that we can put some additive of uh, polyphosphate ammonium, And so we can get a V0 fire uh, certification also for uh, these injected cabinets. That's also something important for uh, installation. Uh, but if I may uh, to finish, it's not, we're not dogmatic, you know, it's not we go this direction or we go this direction. We also have a very strong know-how, which we've seen on the video just before on the wood machining. Uh, we've been investing uh, in these CNC machines for a, a long time. And there are applications, uh, uh, I'm thinking about monitor, I'm thinking about the plus series, which we've released uh, lately, right? And uh, uh, the plus series are mainly targeted to go, you know, on tours, on festival. Of course, we're going to put them in installation. As Garrett mentioned, these two, uh, you know, markets, installation and, and music are extremely strongly connected simply because it's music. Um, so that's the, that's the common point. Um, uh, but yes, for P series, it definitely made sense to make them in wood, uh, especially with the ability to have these curved shapes. 
uh, with a very strong um, uh, uh, polyurethane painting so that uh, you don't get scratched because we know these boxes are going to be moved quite a lot. You know, so you see it's it's different approach. Again, we don't have a dogmatic uh, approach and saying we should go that. It's really a case to case situation. Speaking I, of strains, would you mind? I think over your your right shoulder, I can't quite make it out, but it looks like you've got a skeleton of something. Ah, you, you want you to look at that? that up? Yeah. So before I take it, let me just quickly explain what this is about. Um, in fact, uh, the uh, all the rigging systems that we have on the Nexus systems uh, uh, are designed for total metal continuity, not only top to bottom, but front to back. It means that, in fact, for all our cabinets at Nexo, for all our systems, the box itself, the envelope itself, which can be wood or composite, never car only carries the self-weight of the box, nothing else. So all the analysis we do, all the structural analysis we do on our rigging systems, according to uh, Eurocode and certified by TÜV in Germany, uh, Eurocode, sorry to say, uh, Eurocode is uh, the European standard for uh, uh, steel construction in buildings. So it is the standard that applies to bridges, to roofs in stadiums, to you know, uh, uh, gymnasiums. And this is the standard we certify our systems for, because by the end, this is, you know, this is how they're being used. Uh, let me show you quickly. You can see that's a, geo, that's a Geo M12 skeleton. Let me show it a nice way. You see, so this is the front, this is the back, this is the filter being, you know, uh, uh, attached to it, the rigging system at the back. You see, so we have one rigging point at the back, we have two rigging points at the front, and if we want all the forces to be properly transferred, uh, uh, I feel like I'm in a scientific program. <laughs> if we want all the forces to be transferred front to back here, right, and top to bottom, we need to have this kind of, of, of skeleton, right? You cannot let the wood or the composite carry the, you know, the forces which are transferred from the full cluster. Uh, that's a GM10, sorry, skeleton. So, you know, again, Alan, Brian, it's not only about acoustics, it's about uh, rigging, it's about ease of use, it's about safety. <laughs> it's, uh, that's probably should be, in fact, the top criteria uh, yeah. uh, we, we have to consider first. So, uh, anyway. That's fascinating. Fascinating. We've got a few minutes left here. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A. Uh, we are monitoring that. Lots of hellos coming to uh, Francois and Gareth in the chat uh, from around the world. Um, you know, Gar Gareth, can we quickly talk about the Yamaha Nexo relationship? You know, Yamaha is a musical instrument company. You know, who you know, prof who, who's a pioneer in professional audio, including digital audio. You know, one of the things that I like to say is um, Yamaha is piano to PA. And I think with Nexto, that, that truly, truly becomes a true statement. Can you just talk a little bit about the Yamaha-Nexo relationship for me? Absolutely. It's something that I rant about on a regular basis. Um, going back to, as Francois um, alluded to earlier, when Yamaha and Nexo first started working together, it was in the domain of digital audio. And Yamaha recognized that Nexto were a very early adopter of this um, idea and that we were working very hard towards perfecting it. Um, and it was a decision by Yamaha to get involved at that point. Um, that then obviously led to Yamaha acquiring Nexo um, so that we are now a wholly owned subsidiary of the Yamaha Corporation. Um, what does that mean for Nexo? it means that we're not just Nexo. We're not that speaker brand in a factory in Paris. We are, as a group, the world's largest professional audio company, bar none. In fact, you can virtually add up all of our competitors in the marketplace and they don't match what Yamaha produces in the market. So the big strength, I think, is yes, Yamaha is a musical instrument company. Um, and Nexo is a large format PA company at the other end, but there are so many synergies within this marketplace from the development of the NX amplifiers, which took place alongside Yamaha, 
to um, working on Dante networking in the digital audio domain, from Nexo introducing control of our systems by ProVisionaire, so ah. that you can take a Nexo system and use a Yamaha control system on that. Um, the R&D development and market potential of working between Nexo, Yamaha and the other group companies, whether that be Line 6, Steinberg or whoever, um, it, who wouldn't invest in that portfolio and that stable, especially, dare I say, as we're in more uncertain times these days, you know, it's strength is not to be yeah, it, Nexo becomes part of that total solution. So, you know, it, 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 it's very comprehensive. Yeah. Excellent. I have one question in the Q&A for Francois. Um, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but is there a place where the Plus Series just isn't at home? Is there a play, Is there an application that you can think of where it's not great? Um, really Loaded not. question. <laughs> It, yeah, it's uh, you know you had this uh, uh, you, you asked Garrett about versatility. Uh, again, uh, Nexo has been such a strong company in this category. You know, uh, uh, of point sources, we have now the, the full range, which is eight, ten, twelve, fifteen. So you know, depending on uh, what production companies want to do or installation, you know, maybe they want to have a small format for corporate events. Maybe they want to have the fifteen for rock and roll events. But maybe they want the in between. So our offer is wider than what it used to be uh, with the PS. So uh, I think the only place uh, I think I said that in a video <laughs> some time ago. Yeah, I, I think, think maybe it, somebody yeah, saw your video. The only, place, the, it was a joke. Uh, the only place where <laughs> PS series plus series won't feel comfortable is in the warehouse. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see that. Yep, yep. Somebody, <laughs> somebody was playing a prank on you. Clearly, yeah, excellent. Nice. So with that, we are at time. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. You know, just want to close with one statement from somebody in the. Uh, in the chat here saying that their uh, CD18s, PS8s, 10s, and 15s were purchased in 2005 and, and are still working on the job, still look and sound great. You know, so I think that that says something right there. Um, so thank you guys for joining me. Again, if anybody has questions for Francois uh, or Gareth, feel free to get in touch. Um, I believe they've uh, we've put my email address in the chat. Um, Trace, if you don't mind throwing that in there, if you want to just put some contact information for me uh, and perhaps Francois and Gareth as well, that would be wonderful. Again, thank you so much. We are at time. Uh, please, yep, please join us for our future sessions. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. It was, a, it was a pleasure.